Good morning, Chapel family. Here are your announcements for the week. Ladies, help yourself to the informational flyers at the Women's Ministry area, the Welcome Center, as well as the exits. These flyers have information about our upcoming Women's Retreat on April 25th through 27th. We would love for you to invite a friend and enjoy a weekend of sweet fellowship and learning. Thanks again for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us here at the chapel. At this time, take a few minutes to greet the people around you and then we'll continue on with the service. darkness, the sky didn't make a sound, no breeze to soothe a weary soul, no tears of heaven to wash away the bloody timbers of the cross. We held our breath in disbelief, the guards watched in confusion. Jesus, the King of the Jews, is dead. How could this happen? We believed him. Is this the great deception of heaven that we would be mocked and misled by God? The prophets promised one that would save us, one who would bring freedom and healing. We thought it was this Jesus. We were sure it was him but he is a man just like the rest of us. And now we are left alone. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body pounds and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all of Darkness had won, heaven silent as a tomb. But then, out of the shadows, something happened. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the sun of heaven.
Sunday. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Yes, let's proclaim this morning who he is and all that he's done for us. This is our God. Amen. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Sing it out, church. And this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. The grave, let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, faith so weak that we could barely pray. But He heard every word, every whisper. Those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. And 
and this is our God, this is who He is, He loves us. This is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did, who paid for all of our sin, nobody but Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit, he did, he did, who paid for all of our sin, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Him This is our God This is who He is He loves us This is our God This is what He does He saves us He bore the cross Beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. For the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Amen, this is our God, this is our God. And his name is the name that is above every name. And it's the only name that deserves all of the glory and honor and praise. And one day we will join in heaven singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? Amen. Amen. and generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to them. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to them. Your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all
Yes, you will always be holy, holy forever. Yes, Father, this morning we just stand here in awe of you for what you've done for us. Thank you for sending Jesus to sacrifice himself, to pay for our sins and endure a price that we could never pay. And so God, this morning we stand here with hearts full of gratitude, full of praise, full of joy, because we know on this Resurrection Sunday that Jesus is alive. He is risen and he's conquered death and the grave and sin no longer has its hold on us. We thank you for that. Oh, and we look forward to that day when we will join with all of heaven and we will fall down on our knees and just worship you forever and ever and ever. Thank you. Be with us now as we continue to worship you by giving our tithes and our offerings, God. I just pray your blessing over it and for it to be used for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks again, Lori. <clears throat> what a weekend we've had. If you were here Friday night, what an awesome tenebrae service we enjoyed together. The worship team did an awesome job leading us on that night, and I, I hope you were here and benefited from that. Also, yesterday afternoon with the extravaganza, what an afternoon that was. We had 188 children here. Just to give you perspective, our previous best was the year before we had 95. So there were kids all over the place. That was 188 ch children. When you add the parents to that, this place was packed. But a lot of people heard the message of Jesus that day, so that was good. Amen. But we're in a series this morning where we're looking at two of the big questions people ask at Easter. Last week, hopefully you remember, we looked at why Jesus had to die. Why did God have to go to such extremes to actually have his son Jesus die on the cross? Like, why couldn't he just say that we were forgiven and then get on with it? And today, for the second question, we're looking at what's so special and what's the point of Jesus rising from the grave? Like, what's the big deal with the resurrection? Why are we so excited about it? Well, one of the most difficult things about Christianity is that on the surface, it seems like there's a lot of wishful thinking and a lot of hope-filled dreams. And by that, I mean people accuse believers of saying stuff like, hopefully, one day when I die, everything's going to work out. And hopefully there's a God out there somewhere. And hopefully he's a good God who lives in a good place. And hopefully people who are relatively good will get to go there. And hopefully I'm one of those people. But where we have to deal with this is when we're talking to our friends about the benefits of having a relationship with Jesus. When you initiate a conversation with them, if you're like me, they give you a patronizing stare as they say stuff like, well, that's really good and I'm so happy for you. And so then I followed up by doing my best to talk about how Jesus changed my life and even quote a few verses. But they're still thinking, eh, that's nice. Whatever is good with you is fine with me. And I'm really glad you're happy and I'm glad that what you believe helps you get to sleep at night. But the reason they say that is because they think that Christianity is simply one religion among many other religions to choose from. So when somebody plays the one religion among many card, we think we're stumped. And that's because there's this tendency to simply lump Christianity into a pile with all other world religions. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we know that there's a huge distinction that separates 
what we believe from what others believe. Most of the other's religions believe that a person needs to be good to get into heaven. But we believe that you can be bad and still get into heaven. And you'd think that alone would motivate more people to believe in Christianity. That's one of the differences. But this morning we're going to look at another difference. And I believe this difference is the showstopper. Too many times we overlook this point and then focus on the more practical and pragmatic benefits to follow Jesus. And by that I mean some of our selling points for following Jesus is that we tell people that before we became a Christian, my marriage was terrible, but now my marriage is great. Or before I trusted Jesus, my life was a mess, and now it's so much better. We tend to emphasize the practical benefits to a relationship with Jesus when we talk about Christianity, and I don't want to minimize those practical benefits because they are really important. But there's something else that separates Christianity apart from every other world religion that too many times people overlook. Now, what I'm going to say now may sound heretical, but just hang with me. The foundation of our faith is not the teaching of Jesus. I say that because the foundation of all the other world religions is somebody's teaching. Usually all the other world religions had a prophet who showed up and said all kinds of helpful stuff or even wrote things down in their book. And I get it. Jesus said some incredible things, and we follow his teachings because of that. But, that it, but what he said isn't the foundation for why we believe what we believe. Also, the foundation of Christianity isn't a philosophy of life or a mantra to live by. Other religions have a philosophy of life that their followers subscribe to. Eastern religions are famous for having a philosophy of life. But the foundation of Christianity isn't a philosophy of life or even a worldview. The foundation of our faith and what sets us apart from every other world religion is an event. The whole Christianity deal hinges on one event that happened in history, and the event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the focus point for everything we believe. The fact that our relationship with Jesus does make our marriages and our decision-making so much better isn't the foundation to why we believe what we believe. Those things are wonderful fringe benefits to believing in Jesus. And the fact that Jesus taught life-changing principles is wonderful. I've given my life to follow what Jesus taught. And what he taught really has helped me in some profound ways. But what Jesus taught isn't the foundation of our faith either. Again, it's just another one of those fringe benefits to our faith. The foundation to our faith and what sets us apart from every other world religion is one world-changing event, and it's that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So now the question becomes, why is that so significant? You see, all other world religions had a cornerstone prophet who eventually died. Some of those guys were martyred. And then their disciples carried on their legacy and their teachings. But do you know what Jesus' disciples did after he was martyred? They went fishing. They were so discouraged, they thought they had just wasted three years of their life following this guy. So they huddled together in a room, scared out of their minds, because they thought the same religious leaders who just nailed Jesus to a tree was now coming after them. And because their money was running out and they had no purpose to their lives anymore, they went back to what they knew how to do, which was fishing. It was fun while it lasted, but it was obvious those guys, to those guys that Jesus was a fraud. And that's why we can say that Christianity wasn't launched from Jesus' teachings. And it wasn't even launched from his crucifixion, because after his crucifixion, everybody thought the movement died. It really was launched by his resurrection. You see, if Jesus had just taught good things about how to get into a relationship with God and how to make your life better, if he had just stayed on those topics when he was martyrs, his followers could have kept his dream alive and taught everybody how to love one another, how to turn the other cheek, and all that other stuff. But Jesus went too far. He said things like, when you see me, you've seen the Father. And I and the Father are one. And then he even said, I am the way, the truth, the life. I'm the only way to God. When Jesus said stuff like that, he painted himself into a really tight corner. And that's because everybody understood that when Jesus said stuff like that, he claimed to be God. 
And then he said, oh, by the way, I'm going to die and then rise from the dead three days later. The problem was Jesus made it really clear and he was so specific that when he died, his dream died with him. It was over. So why get all excited and why keep it going? Everything he said must have been a lie. So let's just get on with our lives and go back to what we know, which is fishing. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And when that happened, those cowardly, deeply depressed guys went out and turned the known world upside down. And we're here today, 2,000 years later, talking about it, not because of what Jesus said, and not because of all the miracles he performed, and also not because he died on the cross. What sent his disciples out with their hearts on fire was they saw a dead guy come back to life. Add to that, overnight, thousands of Jewish people in Jerusalem abandoned their Jewish heritage and embraced Christianity, not because they heard a good sermon and not because they saw Jesus die. All those people abandoned everything they had been taught because of an event that was so undeniably true that you'd have to deny logic to convince yourself that it didn't happen. Hundreds of people saw Jesus alive and then became witnesses to their friends and family of that event. And it also caused such a political disturbance, as we're going to see in a few minutes, that Rome had to get involved. But those cowardly guys who ran for their lives after Jesus was arrested and denied knowing him when little girls confronted them and wouldn't even stand at the cross to be associated with them, those same guys went out, took incredible risks, changed the world, and then died as martyrs, not because of a teaching or an ideology or a philosophy of life, but because they saw a dead guy come back to life. So to be a follower of Jesus means that what you believe is radically different from what everybody else believes. Now, if you would, to actually see what these guys, ha what happened to these guys and what they did, take your Bibles or your phones and turn them with me to Acts chapter 3, verse 13. While you're doing that, and by the way, it's page 1080 in the Bible if you want to use the, the Bibles in the rack in front of you. And we're going to be in either chapter 3 or chapter 4 all morning, so it might be helpful for you to follow along. But while you're doing that, and to set the context, at this time, Jesus, uh, Jerusalem is in a flat-out turmoil. The Romans had put the Pharisees and the other religious leaders in charge to keep control of the people. But all of a sudden, there were reports that a crucified and buried Jesus was now walking around. And then thousands of people had stopped believing in Judaism and were now following this dead guy who had come back to life. And because of that, these relig religious leaders now were losing control, which made those guys even more nervous because if Rome got wind of this, they might come and take back control themselves. In the meantime, Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples, had become point leaders for the movement. And one day, as was their habit, they were heading to the temple to pray. And when they got there, they saw a middle-aged guy who was handicapped from birth. So Peter and John stopped to see this guy for a few moments, healed him, and then continued on to the temple. So now, besides the report spreading about a dead guy who was walking around, now there's this guy who had never walked before in his life. And everybody knew and saw every day as they were walking into the temple, they saw this guy walking around too. And this just magnified all the chaos for these religious leaders. So Peter, or, or so people were asking Peter and John to explain what in the world is going on, and these guys were quick to say that they didn't want any of the credit for this. Everything that happened was due to Jesus of Nazareth, who these people crucified. The power of Jesus was the one who healed this handicapped guy. So now to take a look at what happened, look at verse 13, and let's set, let set the tone. This is right in the middle of a sermon Peter is preaching to a whole bunch of Jewish people who just happened to be walking to the temple on the same day when Peter and John were walking to the temple and healed this guy. So look at verse 13. It says there, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. 
So Peter is putting the yell on with these people, which is amazing. What happened to change his outlook on life? The last time we saw him, he was denying that he ever knew Jesus to a teenage girl. And now he's pounding the pulpit talking about the resurrected Jesus. But anyway, there was such an uproar over what was happening that the religious leader, leaders scheduled a meeting to discuss the issue. And they decided that in, in light of that, they'd arrest Peter and John. And this is where our story picks up in chapter 4. Look at verses 1 to 4. It says there, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. This is outside the temple after they healed the handicapped guy. They were greatly disturbed. I guess they were because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The passage says that 5,000 men believed in Jesus. But to get the total number of people, you need to throw in their wives and a couple hundred kids, which would bring the total, I'm guessing, closer to about 10,000. And these 10,000 people were Jews who basically said they were leaving Judaism. All their lives prior to this, they were taught the Old Testament law and the feast days and all of that. But now they've heard reports, and many of them actually saw Jesus walking around. So they're leaving everything their parents and the synagogue leaders taught them and began to follow Jesus, which begs the question, why? Why would these people do that? Well, as hard as it is for me to admit, when you look at the situation, it be wasn't because of a sermon that somebody delivered. It wasn't a sharp or really hip guy like me who delivered a knockout message that wowed these people. It was that Jesus was raised from the dead. Let's continue on, verses 5 and 6. It says there, The next day the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. So why do you think it was that Luke included the details of these guys' names in this account? I think he did it so that readers like you and me could connect history to the period of time when these events actually happened. That way you and I could trace the resurrection of Jesus back to an actual time with actual people, and we could determine with certainty that what God did with Jesus was true and historically accurate. Let's go on, verses 7 to 10. It says there, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question him, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a handicapped guy, and we are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. The courage of Peter is amazing. A few days before this, when Jesus was arrested, Peter was warming his hands by a fire when a teenage girl recognized him as somebody who was with Jesus. And Peter's response was pretty cowardly. That wasn't me. I have, I have no idea what you're talking about. I never knew the guy. So now we need to ask, what happened between that day and the day when this situation happened in our passage? Did he hear another Bible teacher give a message? Well, to quote that great theologian and comedian, John Panette, oh, nay, nay, he saw Jesus, and the resurrection Jesus changed his life. Suddenly, Peter, this cowardly guy who was threatened and seemed hopelessly insecure, was transformed. And so now he's saying to all who would listen, you can arrest me, you can beat me, you can even torture me, but I can't deny what I saw. Peter keeps talking to these guys in verse 18. Look at verses 18 and 20. Then they, the religious leaders, called them, Peter and John, in again and commanded them not to teach or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about, for, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Can you believe this guy? Eventually, both Peter and John were martyred for the stand they took. Peter and John weren't tortured and eventually faced death because of what they believed. 
There were lots of martyrs who died for what they believed. So martyrdom wasn't that unusual at this time. Peter and John faced persecution and eventually gave their lives because of what they saw. And that sets followers of Jesus apart from every other world religion. Fox's Book of Martyrs records for us how Peter died. He had been sentenced to death, and the officials were planning to crucify him, but he asked that they not execute him in that way because he didn't think he was worthy to die in the same way as Jesus, his Savior, was crucified. So they honored Peter's request and crucified him upside down. Now, from all you know about how brutal crucifixion was as a form of execution, can you imagine what it was like to be crucified upside down? And yet Peter did it because he saw Jesus being nailed to a cross and he saw the Roman guards put him in a grave. But more importantly, he saw Jesus alive three days later. Those same Roman authorities took the Apostle John and exiled him to a deserted island to waste away for the rest of his life. But he never recanted either. How, how could he? How do you say you didn't see what you saw? Christianity rises and falls not on Jesus' teaching as life transformational as his teaching was. Christianity rises and falls on an event that's so pivotal and so life transformational that his disciples were willing to give their lives because they couldn't deny what they saw. To see even more of this in verse 32, Luke tells us what it was like to be part of the church that these people were part of. And it's pretty cool. Look at verses 32 and 33. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. You see, the message that these people kept talking about was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it changed the lives of thousands of people in that day and the lives of millions of people ever since that day. But, and this is key to our discussion this morning, just as the resurrection of Jesus was the foundation of their faith, it also needs to be the foundation of our faith. Everything we do and believe hinges not on what Jesus was taught, or the miracles he did, as important as they are. Everything we believe in and hold to hinges on this one event in history. That's why the Apostle Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we are of all people most miserable. We've been duped big time. He went on to say that if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, every pastor's preaching is useless. Now, wait a minute, Paul. What you said really helped me with my wife and my, in our marriage. And everything you said about kids obeying their parents, that was spot on, and it was really helpful for us as we raised our kids. But Paul says, no, that stuff might be good and helpful, but if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it doesn't matter how our marriages are good or not and that our kids are well-behaved. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this whole deal is useless, and we're living a lie. And Paul even went further. He said that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith is futile and we're still in our sins. The resurrection isn't something that we tack on because it makes a nice ending to our story. The resurrection is something that ignited a fire in the hearts of those first century believers who then went out and changed the world. And so Paul said that the resurrection is so critical that if this one event isn't true, everything that involves God and Jesus is going to collapse. But there's a practical side to this, meaning there's something in Jesus' resurrection for us today. The resurrection of Jesus is not only the foundation of our faith, it also becomes the foundation to our faithfulness. The reason you and I are committed to Jesus and the reason that you and I can say it works and the reason you and I can follow Jesus with surrender and a commitment level that might cost us something at times is because Jesus rose from the dead. At the end of the chapter that I referred to earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. And he gives us something to do right now in every area of our lives when he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In other words, because Jesus rose from the grave, you and I don't give up when life gets tough. 
In every situation, be strong and don't waver. Or as Paul says, let nothing move you. This is one area in your life where it's okay for you to be stubborn and bullheaded. When it's convenient, we stay faithful. When it's inconvenient, we stay faithful. When it works out relationally, we stay faithful. When it doesn't seem to be working in your relationships, you still stay faithful. And for that reason is because the foundation of our faith isn't that as followers of Jesus, our lives are always going to work out. The foundation of our faith is that Jesus came back to life and that validated who he was and what he taught. You see, as long as you're faithful because it's working for you, there will be days when it'll appear like your faith isn't working for you. The reason it works and the reason you love following Jesus is partly because we live in the U.S. We have a lot of freedom to worship because of where we live. But if you lived in other countries around our world, your Christianity would be a whole lot harder to live out. But that shouldn't matter because in a culture where Christianity is working or even where it isn't working, Paul said, we still hang in there. We're still steadfast and we keep following Jesus because Jesus rose from the dead, which is a nice segue to the second application point. When he rose from the dead, Jesus proved that he was who he said he was. The resurrection proves that what he said about life, what he said about death, about how life works, also what he said about your life and about my life, what Jesus said about all that is all true. When Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, we can bank our entire lives on that statement. When the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd, we can trust that statement too. Because Jesus rose from the grave, we can trust with confidence that everything he said is spot on. A whole bunch of people have set out to disprove the resurrection of Christ. They thought that if they could disprove the resurrection, they'd just make Christianity go completely away. And none of them were, su were successful. In fact, everyone I know who tried that ended up submitting their lives to follow Jesus. Josh McDowell was one of those guys. Josh McDowell was an atheist attorney who set out to prove that the resurrection of Jesus was a hoax. He was unsuccessful and instead gave his life to Jesus and eventually became a popular Bible teacher and author. And after all of his research and study to disprove the resurrection, this is what he said. There's more evidence that Jesus rose from the grave than that Christopher Columbus discovered America. There was a pastor who was traveling in Italy it was in a cemetery when he came across the grave of a man who had died centuries before. He read on the tombstone that the guy wasn't a follower of Jesus. In fact, he took a stand completely against Christianity. But as the pastor read the guy's epitaph, he could tell that the guy was a little unsure of his belief system because he had a huge stone slab placed over his grave that he was hoping would keep him from being raised from the dead just in case there was a resurrection but also he had an inscription etched on the slab that read, I do not want to be raised from the dead. I don't believe in it. But unbeknownst to him, during his burial, an acorn must have fallen into the grave because a 100 years later, the acorn had grown up through the grave and split that cement slab into two. And now the acorn was becoming a towering oak tree over the grave. The minister looked at that and asked, if an acorn, which has power of life in it, can split a slab of that magnitude, what can the acorn of God's resurrection power do in a person's life? That's a really important question to ask, don't you think? What does it mean that historical facts support a resurrected Jesus? And more importantly, what does it mean to you? And it's at this point where we can bring all those fringe benefits to following Jesus back into play. Since Jesus rose from the grave, you and I can know with certainty that what he taught was correct. If that's the case, that if we follow him and apply what he said to our lives, it will make our marriage better. And Jesus' principles will help us raise our kids and also will help us make better decisions. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the Apostle Paul told us, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That means the Holy Spirit, who was the power source behind Jesus' resurrection, now lives in us and wants to be the power source in our lives to help us follow Jesus. Think of the things right now that you think are immovable slabs in your life. Your bitterness, your insecurity, your fears, your self-doubts, your addictions. 
Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit, can split those things that now seem to be a problem for you. Over time, the oak tree of God's work in your life can grow you up into something special and significant if you will let him. As we close, I want, I want to leave us with one more fringe benefit to the resurrection of Jesus. I, I was thinking of this with all the loved ones and close friends that we lost over the past few years. The last fringe benefit is because Jesus rose from the grave, as followers of Jesus, we have the promise that we too will rise from the grave. Tony Campolo is one of my favorite Bible teachers. He's a funny guy and a good author, and he tells the following story. He says, I went to my first black funeral when I was 16 years old. A friend of mine, Clarence, had died. The pastor was incredible. From the pulpit, he talked about the resurrection in beautiful terms. He had us thrilled. He came down from the pulpit, went to the family, and comforted them from the 14th chapter of John. Let not your heart be troubled, he said. You believe in God, believe also in me, said Jesus. Clarence has gone to heavenly mansions. Then for the last 20 minutes of the sermon, he actually preached to the open casket. Now that's drama. He yelled at the corpse, Clarence, Clarence. He said it with such authority, I wouldn't have been surprised if there had been an answer. He said, Clarence, there were a lot of things we should have said to you that we never said to you. You got away too fast, Clarence. You got away too fast. He went down this litany of beautiful things that Clarence had done for people. When he finished, and here's the dramatic part, he said, that's it, Clarence. There's nothing more to say. When there's nothing more to say, there's only one thing to say. Good night. Good night, Clarence. He grabbed the lid of the casket and slammed it shut. Good night, Clarence. With the thud of the lid of the casket, shock waves went over the congregation. As the preacher then lifted his head, you could see there was a smile on his face. He said, good night, Clarence, because I know, I know that God is going to give you a good morning. The choir stood and started singing, on that great morning, we shall rise, we shall rise. We were dancing in the aisles and hugging each other. I knew the joy of the Lord, a joy that in the face of death laughs and sings and dances, for there is no sting to death. You see, no world religion has made or ever can make a promise like that. Mohammed never said it. Buddha never said it. But Jesus said it. Jesus said that because of his resurrection, this life is not allowed to have the last word for people who follow him with their lives. So because of the resurrection of Jesus, your assignment for today, for tomorrow, and for every day that God gives you life to follow him is be steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for your labor is never in vain. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Our minds are trying to grasp hold of what it is wrapped up in us, but Father, just thank you for the promise and, and the little things that we gather here and there to keep us empowered to follow you in a very hard world. God, thank you that the Holy Spirit lives in us, the same Holy Spirit that unleashed his power that brought Jesus back from the grave. That's an awesome thought. So we look at the struggles we have this afternoon. Some of us are going to our families, and some of those relationships are strained, are going back to work tomorrow, and that is one problem after another. But, Father, with the power of the Holy Spirit in us and the resurrected Jesus behind us, we can understand that your power is greater than anything we're going to face. So, Father, allow this to become a reality in our lives that we never saw before. Thank you for who you are and what you mean to us and how you continue to show up in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and sing out our closing song together this morning. Separated, reach was far.
where to hide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. bringing us from that darkness, that darkness that we experienced on Friday. God, that darkness that you walked through for us. And we thank you that on this Resurrection Sunday, through the risen King, you brought us into glorious light. Oh God, I pray for anyone here today who maybe has not walked out of that darkness. They haven't quite said, I believe. Oh God, I pray that they will. That they will know 
that Jesus is alive and that they will put their faith and their trust in you, their Savior. And then, God, I pray for those of us that have taken that step. God, may we be like those disciples. May we be like Peter, giving our lives to follow you in total surrender to whatever it is that you are calling us to and to be on mission to share the gospel, this good news that we have, God, with those people that you place in our lives. Help us to be bold for you, Lord Jesus. We thank you and praise you for this time we've had to come and just celebrate, celebrate the resurrected King. And we look forward to that day when we do worship you forever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us on this Resurrection Sunday. Have a blessed Easter. We'll see you back next week.